Good morning. I'd like to wish you all a early Fourth of July for you. May that you have a may you have a wonderfully safe time with your family and friends. Let me see this. Ooh. So this morning, what I want us to think about and to look at is what it means and what it is to be a good disciple. And as we're speaking and thinking of the idea of disciple this morning, it'll be in the context of the biblical usage, which is to be a follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what is a good disciple? In order for us to be a good disciple, we must be prepared. And what this means is something which Jesus addresses and calls to our very attention as he hi highlights the need for one to count the cost in the means of commitment. To consider the priority and the sense of value and to clear the distractions of life is where our focus should be. So Jesus calls us to follow him. And sometimes we don't think about what that really truly means. What is it to truly, what does it mean to truly follow him? You know, we can put it in a way that's more personal. That is it, to say, what is the cost to follow Jesus Christ? Because believe me, it's going to cost you. Exactly what? We'll get to in our study. But for now, I would like you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 57 to 62. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. As they were going down the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, No one after putting his hand on the plow and, look, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So here we have Jesus. He's traveling along the road. When we hear this talk of following, following who? Following Jesus Christ, of course. And isn't it, and it, this isn't the first time that this has happened. It's happened before. But what we're going to look is at what happened on this particular occasion. Here we have three men who are having serious thoughts about following Jesus. Or at least they thought they were serious about it. But we'll see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we ask for guidance as we go through your word. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you lead us, that we may gain insight of your will for our lives through these examples. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all those that are here with us this morning to worship you and to glorify your name. Be with us this morning. Amen. So here we have three men in our story. Two of them declared that they wanted to follow. And as we see, the third is actually the one who, Jesus, who is called by Jesus. Right? So we have three guys. Jesus actually calls one. And as we look at this, we can wonder and maybe be shocked by the way Jesus responded to them. Because as we look at them, they, you know, they seem to show interest. But, you know, if you, if you look, Jesus gives an impression that he's not really being sure of them. And you would think someone who is eager to recruit 
right? We try to get as, much, as many followers as possible. The more people, the better, at least from, from our point of view, right? But as we look here at Jesus, what he's doing is kind of strange, but he takes a different approach. On the surface, it looks like he was trying to discourage these people from following him. He didn't want them to be ignorant of what they were getting themselves into. Look at the first man. He's ready to jump on board, right? This guy is sure of what he wants. He seems self-confident. He didn't even wait to be called. Yet, he offered himself without thinking of the cost. Do we know what we're getting ourselves into when we decide to say we want to follow Jesus? Sometimes I wonder if we do. Just like this guy, we don't always think three things through. So Jesus places the truth right before them so they can see it for themselves and be prepared for it. You know, it's like running a race. You know how many people, when they're running, right? When I was a kid doing cross country, people, that gun goes off, pow, these people go off. Cross country is distance, it's far, <laughs> right? They're at the starting line, they have all this enthusiasm, they have all this energy. It's only later when they realize you need to pace yourself, right? What happens is they don't realize the distance or the obstacles, you know, probably the difficult terrain. Sometimes you're running hills, which, you know, takes a toll on you. Endurance is required. Most importantly, the training they need to put in before the race to prepare for it. Because truthfully, that's what it takes. You need to be ready. You need to be ready. And don't misunderstand. Here we see that Jesus doesn't discourage them. What he was doing is he was preparing them. Preparing them for what? Preparing them for success. We need to prepare spiritually, mentally, and psychologically. We need to be prepared for what we're signing up for when we see, say we're ready, ready and willing to follow Jesus Christ and serve him. Because truthfully, it isn't something really easy. It's really difficult. It's really, really difficult. I've seen this happen to people who feel they want to serve in ministry, but you know, they don't realize if you really want to truly serve the Lord, be ready for some hardship to come your way. And you know, most aren't. And they quit. Because it wasn't what they thought it would be. I have people thinking that being a pastor is grandeur in your, yeah. <laughs> and people want to do that because they're looking for the wrong things, right? So they get disillusioned when, they, when trouble hits and the things they have to face, and they quit. And you know, I'm speaking of those truly doing ministry, not those who I, who I refer as pretenders, right? Those acting as they're serving God while they're serving themselves in the world. Because that happens. See, if we're prepared, we will not give up. If we're prepared, we'll make sure that we'll run the race very well and finish it. All done by the grace of God. So what are the preparations we need? If we listen to Jesus' warnings, we will be better prepared to follow him with everything, right? With everything. If we go back and look at verses 57, to 57 and 58. As they were going on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds have air, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. See, the first thing we come and we need to see is we need to count the cost. The issue here is commitment. In everything we do, we need to count the cost. It's crucial for success 
whether we're setting up for business, making a deal, getting married, investing in a, a home, right? We do the calculations and count the cost. Accounting calls it budgeting. But as you know, as you know, it doesn't guarantee success. But without it, you're unlikely to, to succeed. See, counting the cost is the issue of commitment. Are you prepared to pray, pay the price? Are you ready to sacrifice? How much are you willing to give up? Right? I mean, do you see this? And have you noticed that these, these things that Jesus is talking about are things that our society have a very hard time to understanding and applying today? Where is the commitment today? Where is the priority today? Where is the focus? It doesn't, really, it doesn't look very good where we're heading. Now we see this man who says, I will follow you wherever you go. Now he didn't understand what he was saying. He was pres presumptuous. He was assuming things. You can say what you'll do without any, any idea of where Jesus may be headed or what might be involved in the journey. Jesus replied that to go wherever he goes isn't going to be an easy road. He's not one of those preachers traveling in town in any form of transportation. He's not staying at five-star hotels. He's not collecting offerings from the crowds that come to hear him. In fact, Jesus never collected any offerings in his three years of ministry. It's a ministry that gives and gives and gives, and it didn't take. Nothing like the things we see around us today. Now, Jesus didn't come out and say it, but the question he was offering to them was this. Are you prepared for that? Is, it, is this too much to ask for? When you face these questions, it should be no. If you really consider what Jesus had given up for us and understand what you're, what you're really doing is investing See, what I mean when I tell you and I say that this is not a job for me, when I say this is not a career for me, it isn't. What I'm doing is I'm investing in what the Lord has given to me and to you. It's an investment for the kingdom. You know, Jesus, Jesus counted the cost, cost when he stepped into, into this world. And for him, for him, it was pain, a, a price worth, worth pay, paying for. Turn to Philippians. Oh. Philippians 2, 5 to 7. So Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard e e uh, equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. See, Jesus had left everything behind him. He gave it up, everything to give us what we have today. He was born, think about this, he was born in a uh, borrowed manger. He lived in borrowed accommodations during his ministry. He rode on a borrowed donkey. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. See, it was Jesus who gave himself to give us salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, and a reconciled relationship with God. He did that for you. He did that for me. He did that for us. What about us? Have we counted the cost? Are you willing to pay the price to serve him? You know, it would not be much to ask if we understood what Jesus gave up for us. 
and what he went through for us. Let's consider the priority, the issue of value. Going back to Luke. I should have, if you, if you look in your little page, or I should have told you to, we'll be coming back to Luke, so you might want to put your bulletin in there or a holder. <clears throat> so going back to Luke 9, 57, uh, 59 to 60. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. You think, wow, this is kind of shocking what Jesus is telling him. It sounded like this man wanted to bury his father. You know, I would expect that's a reasonable request, right? The difficulty is understanding this line in the context. First of all, it's unlikely that this man's father had died because it meant that he would have been mourning, right? If he was in mourning, then he wouldn't have been there with Jesus. Think about that one. That sounds reasonable, right? I remember when I was a kid, I used to work at McDonald's, and I called, I called in for some reason one day with an excuse that my grandmother died. And it's too bad that I didn't remember that I already called some other time <laughs> that she had died already. So, <laughs> right? I just, I didn't remember. The manager said, how many times did your grandmother die? I'm like. Then, when we look at this, secondly, right? It would not be in sync with the other teachings of the Bible. We are told to honor our father and mother. Or like we're told in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 5.8. It says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has de uh, denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, God, does God ever contradict himself? No, never. He never does. See, this man was respons responding to Jesus' call. Not that he offered to follow Jesus. He was likely giving an excuse. I have a family to take care of at the end of, and if, um, sorry, I have a family to take care of, and I cannot follow you now. But, you know, if you wait until my father has died, then I'll consider. That's basically what he's probably saying. Jesus' reply was, let the dead bury their own dead. And obviously he wasn't talking about the physical dead. He was, he was speaking of the spiritual dead. Let the others, the unbelievers, take care of these things. You have more important things to do for the kingdom of God. The key word which we, which we see in verse 59 is the man said, Lord, first let me go. He said, Lord, then first let me go do my own thing. He wanted to follow Jesus on his own terms. Just like we see so many people doing today. Right? They want a God that fits into their schedule. And you know, even though it seems that, that even though it seems that this is what they're doing, it doesn't work that way. Right? And they, eventually they'll find out. And then we see the answer Jesus gave is don't delay. You have a chance now. Don't spend the precious years of your life doing things that are worldly people can do just as well. Give your life to God. Make your life count for the kingdom of God. So it's a question of priority. The issue is, is, one, is one of value. What is important? 
We have our excuses. Everyone has excuses. But God is not looking for excuses. Jump to Luke 14, 25 to 27. Now large, a large crowds were going along with him, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come to me cannot be my disciple. I would think by now you should understand this passage right? It's not calling for us to love our parents less, to honor them less, or to avoid our responsibility to the family. The question of who must come first is important. When you have to make a choice, we need to remember that thing or anyone that we place it in front or between us and God. That will become your idol. Also be reminded of what we're told in Matthew 6.33. It says, But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So what should be our priority? What should be our focus? Do you grasp what he's telling us? What Jesus is doing is he's helping this man see what's most meaningful to him. He's guiding him to consider the priority and towards making the best choices in life. God's calling is unique and different to each and every one of us, but you need to count the cost and you need to consider the priority, it a priority in your life. We also need to clear the distractions. The issue is focus. Going back to Luke, Luke 9, 61 and 62. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand in the plows and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Here on the surface, it looks again like a reasonable request. And you know, Jesus did not deny him. Do you notice that this guy put something first? And let me tell you, no matter what it is, it could be the bestest thing in your whole, in, bestest thing that you do in your whole, in your whole wild, wide world, the bestest thing. Even these, these things are wrong if you're placing it ahead of prompt and complete obedience to God. Think about this. Jesus seen his heart. And what did he see? What he saw was his divided heart. He looked for this opportunity to state another principle that the disciples were aware of, and that is, don't be half-hearted. If you are, you'll likely fail. Jesus describes a man who puts his hand on the plow. See, in reality, this man has already placed his hand on the plow, and he's already gone in the field. And what is it that he's done? He started looking back. He kept looking back while holding onto the plow. Now, now let me ask you, how could he do his work properly if he isn't paying attention to what he's doing? Do you think he's gonna have straight lines? No. See, when you're doing God's work, you need to be focused on what you're doing. You can't be distracted looking back over your shoulder. See, this is the issue of focus. If you have five things going on at one time, it's unlikely you can do any of them any good. You need to focus on one thing, the thing that you have before you. People say, oh, I can multitask. No, you can't. You can't in the kingdom of God. You have to focus on one thing. 
The, the Lord can't do with half-hearted disciples in the kingdom of God. He wants those who are going to provide total obedience to Him. We are told about split devotions. Right? Luke 16, 13. It says, No servant can have two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. See, what he wants is your full and complete attention. Here we have these three men. And we can list the three things that are an interference to discipleship. Their material comfort, their jo jobs or occupation, family and friends. We should understand this, that as we serve our Lord, He deserves nothing, nothing less than our best. Can we have the worship team come up? So let us consider all of these things before we think of responding to His call. We need to faithfully stay true to His call. We need to reflect upon our, our lives. And we need to count the cost. We need to consider the priority of our lives. And we need to clear the distractions of this world in our lives. I ask and plead with you, don't miss out on the greatest opportunity that God has given us. You know, we have one shot at this. Right? That is being serious disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and making a difference with our lives. Amen?